Stanford University. Thanks, everybody. It's um, always a blast to come back to Stanford after, well, close to 30 years now. Um, the, the, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, close to 30 years. The, um, this is a technology-free talk. It's going to separate the geeks from the non-geeks. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the carbon cycle and the climate problem. To put it in the context of GCEP, what I want to do first is to talk a little bit about the effort required to solve the carbon and climate problem. And to make the, the case, which is a pretty simple case to make, that the, the size of the effort depends to zeroth order on the stability of the terrestrial carbon sink. Now, the terrestrial carbon sink has been, in my view, the most vexing problem in global change science. Terrestrial carbon sink is commonly called the missing sink. It was discovered um, a little over, um, what, 30 years ago now, close to 30 years ago, between 20 and 30, depending on who's telling the story. Um, but, the, but the point is that for, th for, for that period of time, for, for several decades now, we've been unable to locate an amount of, of, of CO2 emissions into the atmosphere that is equal to all of the coal or oil emissions to the atmosphere. We know that it's gone into the terrestrial biosphere, but we don't know where and we don't know why. And this is such a huge number, all of the coal emissions in the world, that if it isn't stable going forward, the size of the mitigation effort becomes much, much larger. So then I want to show you um, some results that just came in within the last two months which is the first global forest inventory to try to measure how much weight in carbon that the forests of the world are gaining. And it looks like this identifies the magnitude, the spatial distribution, and the cause of the missing sink. And there's some good news here in that the signature is at least for part of that sink, about half of it, is the signature of CO2 fertilization. Plants eat, of course, CO2 for a living. You put more of them in the, in, in the atmosphere, they eat more, they gain more weight. That's a negative feedback on the, on the growth of the carbon, carbon problem in the atmosphere. So all else equal, this portion of the sink should increase over time uh, and provide a substantial benefit. I want to make clear also that this, the evidence here is by no means yet a slam dunk. I now think for the first time in my career that I know where all this missing sink is going. Um, that's a, that's a, at least a one sigma uh, 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 sort of answer. But, but it's possible that it'll all come crashing down in some way. But one measure of, of the strength of the evidence, for me at least, is that I've argued that this mechanism I'm going to say now is responsible for it wasn't in fact responsible for it. And I've argued that for over 10 years. So in one sense, this is a, this is a scientific defeat. I was on the wrong side of a, of a debate. Okay, I'll also show some recently published evidence that the sink is declining in efficiency. So what is the size of the carbon and climate problem? This is, and, how, and, and what will it take to solve it? Um, this slide comes from the IPCC. Um, you can look at it online, it's a really common one. And what it shows is, th through time, uh, temperature increase. And on the right-hand side, there are a bunch of bars for when catastrophic things happen where you lock in uh, ice sheet melt, West Antarctic ice sheet, Greenland sheet, uh, where you get reduced crop yields at low latitudes, you cause famines in the, in the tropics, where you cause large-scale global extinctions. And you see that those things tend to come in at around 2 degrees Celsius. This is highly uncertain, but the 2 degree number is in fact the basis for most of the policy prescriptions that are, that are discussed now by our country, uh, by the EU, in Copenhagen, and so on. This figure is also from the IPCC. Look only at the one on the right. And there it graphs the, the CO2 concentration. It's actually greenhouse gas equivalents of CO2, so it includes the minor gases as well. And it shows what the equilibrium temperature increase would be with some bars for uncertainty. So look only at the middle one right now. And what you can see is that for two degrees, what you have to do is keep the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases from climbing above about 450 parts per million. As a reference, we started at around 280 or 290. We're currently at around 390. 
and this says, thou shalt not go above 450, or the monsters start to come out to get you, right? So most of the policy prescriptions we have that have been discussed are, are aimed at, at something like this, at achieving a maximum concentration of something like 450 parts per million. Now, for this to happen, it turns out we are completely out of time. The blue curve here is a, is a simple back of the envelope calculation that anybody can do. It assumes business as usual growth in emissions. It assumes that the sink strengths remain approximately the same, that the sinks remain stable. Um, and it assumes that at some point, um, somebody shoots a gun and the world starts to decarbonize its energy system on a 50-year linear ramp, all right? There are many, many ways to make this calculation. You always get the same qualitative answer, and the answer is we're out of time. 450 there is parts per million of CO2. That's more like 475 or 480 for CO2 equivalents. And if you wanted to reach a stability at 450 parts per million, you'd have to start decarbonizing the world at 2013 or 2014. All right, any legislation that was passed today isn't gonna come into effect in any kind of strong way until 2020 or so. So you can see that we're out of time. We're into, we're into larger numbers, unless, you, unless we were going to have some draconian decarbonization of the energy system, didn't allow equipment to be replaced when it wore out and that sort of thing. So, so the point is, is that, is that there's been quite a bit of desperation in the scientific community watching the political events, particularly in the US, but also internationally over the last 12 months, because the view is very much that we're out of time. If we don't act now, we're not gonna get in underneath these numbers that will prevent really, really damaging things from happening, nonlinear sorts of damages. But even this answer depends very strongly on what's known as the airborne fraction, okay? Now this shows the airborne fraction. The top line is the total CO2 emissions to the atmosphere from all sources from 1960 until 2009 in that figure. The bottom wiggly line is what actually ended up in the atmosphere. So all of the top line was emitted, but the bottom line showed up in the atmosphere. In other words, a little less than half, on average, of the CO2 emitted to the atmosphere actually ends up in the atmosphere. And it's the gap between those two that is the natural sink. It's a problem as least as large. In, in other words, the service provided by the, by the natural system is as large as what you all are trying to accomplish, which is to eliminate the second half. Now, the wiggliness of that line is something that we understand. It's caused primarily by um, El Nino climate events and also by fires that are associated with them uh, in the tropics and elsewhere, and there are also a couple of wiggles that are caused by volcanic eruptions. But we don't, haven't known why completely the gap uh, occurred. Now this shows um, uh, uh, in a little bit more granular detail where that um, uh, sink, the gap between the the amount that we emit and the amount that ends up in the atmosphere where that sink is going. In 2000 to 2008, we emitted 7.7 .7 billion metric tons of carbon from fossil fuels, the bottom one on the, on the left-hand side, and 1.4 billion metric tons from, from tropical deforestation. Of that, 45% ended up in the atmosphere. That's the atmospheric fraction, 45%, the airborne fraction. The remainder, of the remainder, a little less than half the remainder, went into the oceans. We pretty well understand why it went into the oceans, where it's going, have eight different ways of measuring and estimating those amounts, they all agree, and so we understand the mechanisms that are responsible for that oceanic sink, have a pretty good idea of what its stability is gonna be and so on. But the three billion metric tons, as I said, equal roughly to the total coal emissions that go into the terrestrial biosphere, we do not understand. We know it went into the terrestrial biosphere primarily by process of elimination. It didn't go into the atmosphere and it didn't go into the ocean. But also because we've got some isotopic signatures that, that say it was fixed by biological photosynthesis, okay? Now, what could cause the land use, uh, the, the, the land sink, the terrestrial sink, this, this coal-sized chunk of missing carbon? 
And there are three different mechanisms that have been uh, fought over. I'll start with the bottom. Land use change is the first one. A secondary forest is a forest that was cut down for the first time, all right, at some point, and then allowed to regrow as forest. That's called a secondary forest, if I use the jargon again later. And so when um, land has been cleared for agriculture or for forestry, and it's allowed to regrow, that carbon comes from the atmosphere and it creates a transient sink. You may know that, that there has been land use change and decreased harvesting in several different parts of the world, and it's created evidently very large sinks. In, in about the turn of the last century, say 1920, if you flew uh, over the eastern part of the United States, you would have found almost no forest there at all. If you do that now, 75% of the land is forested and it's regrowing. Part of it's harvested, but not enough of it's harvested to keep up. Easterners sort of lost interest in mowing their lawns and it's been growing back uh, ever since. Climate change is another piece. The climate can warm, cause higher productivity and so on. But generally climate change is tricky because most models show that warming accelerates decomposition, particularly in the north where the, where, where the warming is greatest, and that, and that decomposition should cause outgassing, not, not uptake. And the final one is CO2 fertilization. CO2 fertilization is the one you hope for because it's the only one of these three that's gonna grow through time. Land use change, eventually the land recovers, the trees don't get any bigger, deaths of the trees balance regrowth and the system equilibrates and no longer takes up carbon, all right? Once the total amount, once the total mass of, of, of the forest has, has reached what it used to be when it was primary forest, before it was ever cut down, the sink goes away. Climate change, as I said, it's thought that warming is gonna cause outgassing in the north that's gonna more than balance the uptake in the south. And so it's only CO2 fertilization that we're betting on to maintain this sink and make this problem tractable at all. Now there is some evidence for CO2 fertilization, but there's also a lot of reason to be worried about it. In, now this, what this slide shows us on the, on the horizontal axis, um, the NPP of some controls in what's known as a, as, a, as a phase experiment. What is NPP? It's net primary productivity, it's jargon, and it means if you plant a bunch of trees and measure how much carbon they take in because of photosynthesis, subtracting off the respiration of the plants, so the net gain per year, that's NPP. On the vertical axis, you see experimental manipulations in which um, CO2 has been emitted into free air in a ring, and the plants have been gassed with approximately twice the pre-industrial concentration of CO2. Each one of those points is a different face experiment, a free air CO2 experiment. And what you can see is they're above the one-to-one -one line. And so the carbon gain of the, of the gassed plants, CO2-enriched plants, is higher than the control plants, which is CO2 fertilization. The problem is that several of these sites, actually the majority now, don't show a sustained carbon sink. Indeed, the guy who was responsible for this paper, Norby, his site, he was, I was just talking to him this summer at, a, at an ecological meeting, and his site has stopped taking up additional carbon altogether. The reason is that to have a sustained carbon sink, the carbon has to be put into long-lived tissues. So you get 10% more wood this year, 10% more wood next year, and all the wood that you put in last year is still there for it to build up. And these plants are diverting instead this excess carbon into fine roots and fruits that turn over and decompose in a year. Those pools very, very rapidly equilibrate and the sink stops after a year or so. So there's reason to believe that the CO2 fertilization, in fact, will be short-lived and, and not delivered. Other um, studies have shown no significant or prolonged sink. This one from a guy named Christian Corner in Switzerland, who's the only one who actually did a mature forest. He climbed around in the trees with his students and wound several miles of tubing through them, uh, transparent tubing, and increased the concentration of CO2 in the canopy to double, and he got exactly bupkis um, after close to 10 years. Now, it would be bad if, if CO2 fertilization didn't deliver. Um, these two panels are from a paper that came out of my group uh, this year. 
And this involves a model calculation. My group builds a big piece of the Earth system model, the climate prediction model for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And this comes out, for more jargon, out of, it's the so-called GFDL models, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, which is in Princeton. On the, and what these, what these models do here, this is a little different than you normally see. So we've actually calculated what happens under an equilibrium climate associated with a doubling of pre-industrial CO2. So this is 572 parts per million. This says we miss the 450. We don't get our act together, as we aren't getting our act together. And we end up at 572, which a lot of people have thought would be a pretty good outcome. Then what would happen? This says, in the end, what would happen? On the left-hand panel, what we see is that the biosphere would gain 218 gigatons of carbon net. That's about 20 or so years of current emissions, the biosphere would gain that weight. That's a negative feedback. That's good, and that's caused by CO2 fertilization, offsetting all the negative effects of climate change. On the right-hand side, we've eliminated the CO2 fertilization, just taking it out of the model, and the biosphere loses 444 gigatons of carbon. That's a, roughly 50 years of emissions are outgassed. The swing between the two alternatives is, is 60 years worth of emissions. And the reason this is scary is that if the right-hand side happened, we've done some, some transient runs now, the, the CO2 is emitted so rapidly that it would be impossible to keep the atmosphere at 572. This, in fact, isn't feasible. Biosphere outgas is so quick that it carries you past 572 into much higher concentrations. And so it would really, in the long run, be, be very, very damaging indeed if this, if this land sink did not persist. Um, it also matters in the short run. Uh, this is a, a simple back of the envelope calculation. The, 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 the maximum concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere on the vertical axis, that's the target. The year that you have to begin a 50-year decarbonization on the horizontal axis. Look at, on the vertical axis, the line for 500 parts per million. Let's say we miss 450 and go to 500. The answer is if the sink fails, you have to start now to reach 500. And if the sink doesn't fail, you get to go to 2020, between 2020 and 2030. You gain an extra 15 years or so. So even for short-term decision, what it means right now, the balance of kinds of R&D you'd want to do and that sort of thing, this, this issue matters right now. How much time, in other words, do you people at GSIP have to be um, very, very clever? Now, so, so that's the issue. And what I want to do now is talk about what I think um, is possibly the, the answer to the puzzle of the missing sink. Um, and what this is about is a recent global forest inventory. Now, now, first of all, what is a forest inventory? When I was at Stanford as a graduate student, I had a, a, a metric for how boring a particular scientific activity was. And, and it's, is, is it worse or better than watching lizards, okay? So I just spent a lot of time watching lizards as a graduate student. I don't do that, that anymore. The, the problem with the forest inventory is that conducting a forest inventory is more boring than watching lizards. And beyond that, it's really, really hard to do well, all right, which is why, why we haven't had a, a forest inventory. What you do is you go out and measure a whole bunch of trees. Then you come back again, say, five years later, and measure them all again. But because the land surface is so heterogeneous, you have to do that in lots and lots of places. The U.S. forest inventory that the, that the, U, that the U.S. Forest Service runs is done on 100,000 plots. Each plot is a group, actually, of four to 10 small plots. So it's on the order of a million separate plots. Every, on the plot, every single tree is measured. If it dies, its fate is determined. It is otherwise cherished, and other kinds of measurements are taken. And all of that data has to be systematized and put together, and you have to make sure everybody's doing their job correctly, and so on. This is very, very difficult to do in a country like ours, where we spend $72 million a year on it. And the thing is, to answer the question of the missing sink, you would have to do this globally. All right? And there, you've got all kinds of heterogeneity and quality control problems and that sort of thing. Now, recently, with the Forest Service, we brought together all of the forest inventory people from around the world that we could corral. And it was just about, it's just about all the major areas. So 
So Russia and China and all the way through the, uh, 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 Europe, um, uh, all the tropical rainforest countries and so on. And put together the first global uh, forest uh, inventory. Um, the, the, um, there's a couple slides here now that are full of numbers. And I'm going to have some little uh, uh, red arrows since I don't have a pointer um, to cheat. And so we're going to look at this number first. What that number is, is what this forest inventory says would happen if you had a satellite or an atmospheric measurement system that said how big is the net land sink. So how much carbon is transferred from the atmosphere to the land surface, to the forests of the world annually? And that answer is 1.5 billion metric tons. As we'll see in a minute, that number is the balance between secondary forest regrowth, that is regrowing forests that had been cut down, tropical deforestation, and then tropical primary growth enhancement. It turns out tropical forests are growing faster and faster and faster. That's the signature of CO2 fertilization. The missing sink is the next number. That's 2.9 billion metric tons. This is for the period of 2000 to 2007. All right, it's the average from 2000 to 2007. 2.9 billion metric tons is the first number, 1.5, but we've taken away the tropical deforestation, which we already knew about. All right, so that wasn't missing. That was an emission. We take that out of the 1.5 uptake, and then you need a, a sink of 2.9, together with a source that you knew about of 1.4, to get the net sink of 1.5, all right? So that 2.9 is the net flux, which is secondary forest regrowth plus primary um, uh, growth, uh, forest growth enhancement in the tropics. And you can see it's uncertain, but it's not spectacularly uncertain. The final number comes from atmospheric measurements. This is how much emissions were there in the period. In this case, there's one year different in this period. This is the closest thing that's in the published record, 2000 to 2008, rather than 2000 to 2007. And what it says is that if you measure how much CO2 went to the atmosphere, subtract off how much um, is stayed in the atmosphere and how much went to the oceans. So the difference, the missing unaccounted for part just by process of elimination from atmospheric and oceanic measurements, the answer is 3.0. So you can see that there is remarkably good agreement between what the atmosphere says is missing, 3.0, and what you can actually account for in the forest, 2.9. And this is the first time that's been done, all right? Despite the large, large uncertainties there, which would still leave room for a surprise. Let's be clear about that. Those are one sigma uncertainties. Now, it's also true that, that the spatial distribution of this sink is, is, is congruent with what goes on in the atmosphere. The first row is from atmospheric and oceanic data inversions. Now, what does this mean? If I'm a CO2 detector in the atmosphere and I'm downwind of a source, I'm going to see an elevated CO2 concentration. If I know how fast the wind is blowing, I can compute how big that source is. Same for a sink. I'm going to see a depressed concentration. So in three dimensions, if you know the way the wind blows around the planet and you have a network of CO2 sensors around the planet, including inside the oceans, the oceans are fluids too, and this works the same way, you should be able to invert for the source and sink field on, on the surface. And that's what's done in, 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 in these data inversions. We aren't very good at this, all right? And so I'm showing you one that I like. I like it because it doesn't use any Bayesian priors that determine a lot of the answer with the soft signals that are, that are present in the data. And it uses all the ocean and atmospheric data. And what it says is that the net sink from land should be about a gigaton in the northern hemisphere and about nothing in the tropics. All right, so despite the tropical deforestation in the tropics, that should be canceled by a sink in the tropics. What the forest inventory shows is something almost exactly the same, 1.2 gigatons in the northern hemisphere and 0.3 in the tropics. Now, because the inversions, the atmospheric methods are so uncertain, it's better to think about this as, a, as, as, as not being um, as the atmospheric data not being inconsistent with what the forest inventory said, rather than any kind of strong confirmation. But it is true that this forest inventory isn't inconsistent at all with what the atmosphere is saying. Now, this is a sort of slide. If you're a GSEP student or postdoc, never make a slide with this many numbers on it, all right? You're wasting their money if you do, all right? Um, I've got little red arrows to help 
to help us through here. And I want to talk about what's caused the sink in different places, because this turns out to be a complicated problem, and, and there turn out to be heterogeneous answers. The first line there is for Russia. Russia is very large, and it has lots of forest. And it turns out, according to the Russian inventory, the primary cause of the relatively large Russian sink there is the collapse of the harvesting system and the demand for timber products associated with the collapse of the Soviet Union. So a lot of the harvesting programs, in the, in, particularly across Siberia, but also around the Urals and so on, um, uh, collapsed at that time. They went out of business, and they have not started again. All right? This is the line in the inventory that I am least satisfied with. The, the Russian sink has not been possible to verify independently, although we do know from satellite records that they have not been plagued by the insect and forest fire uh, frequencies that we've had across the North American boreal. So that's at least consistent, but there is no independent confirmation of this, and, and there have been historical problems with Russian data. Canada and Alaska, you can believe a lot more, probably Canada more than Alaska because of some problems with the Alaskan inventory. And there, the sink is about zero. And the primary reason is that there have been bark beetle epidemics. Some of that is climate driven, right? It's gotten warmer. And also because there have been fires. And those fires, some of them are associated with bark beetle epidemics. You get bark beetles killing large stands of timber. And then Massachusetts sized portions of, of timber burn. The next piece is inside the United States in the temperate forest. This is a highly believable number because of the $72 million effort, which has recently, in the last 10 years, been systematized so that everybody in every region follows exactly the same research model. Um, this slide here shows from the Forest Service um, a map of the ages of forest stands across the United States. And the only thing I want you to, to observe is that the colors are much warmer east of the Mississippi than they are in the west, right? Except for the Pacific Northwest. And the cold colors mean that the forests are old, over 100 years old. And the warm colors mean that they're young. And you can see that the forests are a lot, warm, are a lot younger east of the Mississippi than in the west. And that's because they're regrowing. Um, there's also a, a, a warm colors in the Pacific Northwest where harvesting has been so intense. Now, if you look, every census, the Forest Service has been doing this back to the 30s, the average age of the forests in the east is older than, than the previous one. So this means that although there's continual reharvesting, they aren't keeping up with their regrowth. And this is, in fact, what's responsible for the sink um, uh, inside the US. In Europe, they have a similar kind of a, of a the, the explanation is similar. But there's one significant difference. And that is that in the highly nitrogen deposited regions downwind of the industri industri industrial northern Europe, there is evidently accelerated growth. There is strong evidence in the data now that the trees are growing faster and faster and faster in the wake of this nitrogen deposition plume that comes out of the heavy industrialized areas in northern, in northern Europe. China was a real surprise for me. China has a sink that's almost as big as the US's. And I would be suspicious of this number, frankly, it's, uh, but, but I'm not. It was caused by um, a planting program that they instituted around 1990, took every scrap of scrubby land and planted it in forest trees in order to generate wood products. So Professor Fang at Beijing, who some of you may know and is, a, is, is the real deal, has gone out and spot checked a whole bunch of these, of these um, forest plots that are otherwise censused by people in the bureaucracy. And he says, you absolutely can believe this. We've also spot checked it with uh, satellites, and we can see the greening that it, that, that it causes. So on balance, I think that the Chinese data are believable. And finally, we've got this tropical number. I'm not going to break this down by region, but I am going to want to show you what the balance is all about. Net in the tropics, it's very close to zero, 0 0.3 billion metric tons. But that's the balance between some relatively large numbers. There's over a gigaton of primary forest sink. That is, forests that have never been cut down that are gaining carbon again, even though they shouldn't be. All right? Primary forests can't gain carbon forever. All right? Eventually, they've got to stop gaining weight. But they have been gaining, and I'll show you that it looks like they've been gaining steadily over the last 30 years. This, I think, is the signature of CO2 fertilization. 
0.6 is secondary regrowth in the tropics. Turns out this better number is bigger than published numbers, but it's pretty unescapable. If you take a look at cleared land in the tropics from the satellite record, that hasn't changed nearly enough to account for the large-scale timber production in these countries. So if you say, how much wood do they produce? Those trees had to come from somewhere. Say, how much land was cleared? And the answer is, and then how much, how much cleared land do you have? It doesn't add up. A lot of that forest is regrowing as secondary forest. Greg Asner here has, has written papers on this as well. Looks like there's a pretty good sized secondary sink in the tropics. And finally, we have the 1.4 billion metric tons of deforestation, stuff that's in the news all the time. Land that's cleared from forest and goes to agriculture. Okay, so this is a picture of the network of plots across uh, uh, the Amazon. And what you see there is a bunch of green arrows going up, which means those plots gained weight, and a bunch of red arrows going down, which means plots in those regions lost weight. You expect there to be a balance because thunderstorms come and knock all the trees down in some sites, and they decompose, and they lose a lot of weight from natural processes. And it's the balance between the big gains and losses that makes a carbon sink. You can see that the greens outweigh the, the reds. And this has been known for a long time. This is a group that's organized by a, by a, a guy named Oliver Phillips in Leeds. Uh, this is the same set of plots, uh, same kind of plots for Africa, where again, green, green overwhelms red. Same is true in Southeast Asia. But what is particularly interesting is that, that although if you look in temperate and boreal forests, forests are on average growing no faster than they used to be. There are particular regions where they are, but there are particular regions where they're growing slower also. That's not true in the tropics. In the tropics, it looks like they're growing faster and faster and faster. The top figures are the only published record of this in, in the literature. This is a 2004 paper. The left-hand bars in each panel show that growth of the forest was faster in the 90s than in the 80s. Now, I don't have the definitive killer figure um, that, that shows the compilation of all this data. It comes from, you see in the bottom, Oliver Phillips' personal communication. If you're in the press and you want to contact him, do so. He talks about this all over the place now, but it's not yet in the published record. What he's done is to compile all of the growth records across the tropics, put them into a 30-year record, and look at the balance of gains and losses. And what you see is that despite uh, 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 droughts in one place and good years in another, that everything balances out so that you get a slow, steady, 30-year, year-on-year increase in the growth rates of tropical trees, which is exactly what you ought to from CO2 fertilization. As a biologist, I know nothing else that would do this thing. All right, so, so for me, who've argued for, for more than a decade that this didn't happen, I, I was convinced by that figure. So look for it in the next year and see if you are, too. All right. So this is good news. Although 50% of the current sinks should decline as secondary forests mature, the other 50% should increase as CO2 rises. There's a little bit of a mystery here, though. How come the tropical forests are CO2 fertilizing, but the temperate and boreal forests aren't, at least not systematically? We do have an, e an explanation for this. Um, our modeling effort says that, that this could be, it, it actually predicts that it is caused by, by nitrogen limitation in the north, but not in the tropics. It turns out that trees that fix atmospheric nitrogen, canopy trees and old growth forests that fix um, uh, atmospheric nitrogen, are common throughout the tropics, but are absent in the temperate and boreal. There's an interest, interesting explanations for that, but let's just leave that as a pattern right now. So there is an engine for nitrogen gain in tropical forests. Something like 20 or 30 percent of the trees are, are, uh, are nitrogen fixers in tropical forests, but not in the temperate and boreal. And, and this supplies the nitrogen that plants need to match with the new carbon so that they can make proteins as well as sugars, all right? So the top uh, panel shows what our, our model says should be the sink if there's no nitrogen limitation. And the bottom panel shows the difference between the size of the sink if there's no nitrogen limitation minus what would happen if there is. So then in the bottom panel, the warm colors mean the nitrogen limitation took away sink. And you can see that there, is, there are warm colors across the northern hemisphere that roughly balance the size of the sink in the top panel, although with a different spatial distribution. Where the spatial distribution is different is in northern Europe and right around New York City, 
which is in the plume of nitrogen deposition. You also don't see warm colors in the bottom panel in the tropics, which means that the sink there should be intact. Okay, I'm just about done here, but I do want to uh, mention um, uh, one other issue, and that is that uh, this is uh, uh, commonly, if you, so, so when you uh, tell um, uh, scientists in the, the work on the carbon cycle that there's a big CO2 fertilization sink or that there's a sink caused by something, the first thing they say is, yeah, but why is the atmospheric fraction constant through time? In fact, Chris Field said this just, just yesterday, right, when I was talking to him about this work. And so this um, uh, graph shows how big the atmospheric fraction was in every year from 19... Uh, 59 to 2009. And again, when I say constant, I'm not talking about the interannual wiggles that we understand, but rather why the mean is approximately flat at 45. Now, it's not a strong theorem that the mean is flat, right? I mean, you could, there's, there's quite a bit of variability there. But there's none of the slow, steady drift upward that you would expect from the mechanisms I've been talking about. CO2 fertilization should decrease in um, efficiency because the enzymatic process starts to saturate as the CO2 builds up in the atmosphere. Land use change should start to saturate as the land gains carbon. It's a concave down function of recovery, right? The carbon uh, versus time is concave down, and so it's a decelerating sink through time. All the mechanisms we know about should decelerate. So how come this sink has been constant? I'm not going to go through this entire explanation, but I want to refer anybody who's interested in this to a paper by Manuel Gluer in 2010 in the Journal of Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics. It turns out that intuition, given that we've got a decelerating efficiency of a sink, how come the atmospheric fraction is constant? It turns out that statement, that deduction, is a failure of quantitative intuition. All right? It's that simple. The, what it all means, if you, if you go back to the original definitions of the efficiency of a sink and so on, um, uh, so I've got a long thing here, which is a math lesson that I'm not going to do, um, but it turns out that that depends on a particular conceptualization about how fossil fuel growth and land use emissions growth has occurred. And because these, the growth rates of these um, uh, uh, emissions is not exponential, but is flatter than exponential through time because of all the, the um, uh, because of all the recessions and whatnot that have taken place. It turns out that what you expect to have happen is that the atmospheric fraction, if the sinks had constant efficiency, the atmospheric fraction should go up, not or should go. I'm sorry, should go down, not up. And and because in fact it's remained constant. It means that the efficiencies of the sinks have themselves gone down, all right? So there's a quantitative argument here that, I've, that I'm not going to have time for if I'm going to have any questions, so I'm not going to go through it. But the important thing is that that argument that you may hear if you're a carbon cycle scientist or if you talk to a carbon cycle scientist, in fact, is a failure of quantitative intuition. And the constant 45% year in and year out atmospheric fraction is, in fact, consistent with a, a sink of declining efficiency. So in summary, our fate depends on a sustainable carbon sink. The size of the job that you all have to do uh, depends on the size of the carbon sink. The terrestrial carbon sink is caused by land use change, primarily in the north, and by CO2 fertilization of tropical forests. That's what the evidence says. The portion of the sink caused by successional recovery will decline through time as the, as the recovery becomes complete but the portion caused by CO2 fertilization should increase and buy us another decade or two. The CO2 fertilization in northern forests may in fact be unlimited, and that's it. So I'd be happy to take a couple of questions if there are any. Thanks a lot. I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned bark beetles in the north and, and fire, which could also be linked to climate change, as being potential reasons for um, 
diminish CO2 fertilization effects in the north versus the south, as well as uh, the nitrogen limitation factor. I'm curious if some non-linearity climate change responses like enhanced pest um, issues decreasing fertilization could be something experienced in the tropics as well, if you see any evidence of that. Yeah, so, so there, there is in fact some published evidence of particular places in the tropics that have warmed disproportionately. There's evidence that some of the trees have struggled. There's some papers by the Clarks from a place called La Selva in Costa Rica. You can look it up on the web, all right? And there, the, there have been elevated temperatures through, across Central America, possibly due to the en enhanced El Nino uh, frequency that, 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 has, that, that has been experienced, in, 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 particularly in that region. And there, they do, in fact, see some negative consequences. Beyond that, the modeling community is almost unanimous in believing that climate change and warming eventually is, is going to be bad for the carbon storage in the biosphere, not just in the north, but also in the south. And a lot of GCMs, ours included, large portion of the Amazon rainforest, for instance, dry up and burn um, if we, uh, under business as usual, CO2 emissions. So Steve, you, you provided plenty of convincing evidence that there's lots of spatial heterogeneity in the, um, in the uh, terrestrial part of the, the carbon sink. Um, and there must be corresponding heterogeneity in the, the um, uptake in the ocean. Um, is, there any, is there any evidence to support uh, changes in efficiency there? Uh, and uh, uh, is that another uh, piece of the puzzle that we need to be worrying about? Yeah, so, so there's some recent evidence that the efficiency of the oceanic sink has declined marginally. And it's from, um, primarily from models that are driven by uh, weather data. And it turns out that uh, wind shear in the great southern ocean has changed and caused a change in the carbon balance of the oceans, in, in models at least. All right. Now, it's important to understand, though, that, that what's being observed is a decrease in a strong positive that's well understood. So as I said, there are eight quasi-independent ways of measuring carbon uptake by the ocean. There's something like 68,000 independent uh, uh, measurements of the, of the CO2 in the ocean. You can trace the, the uh, movement of bomb radiocarbon in, into the ocean, of, of atmospheric testing bomb radiocarbon into the ocean. And, 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 and see that the models are, 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 are working and so on. And all of those agree, and they all say that because of the mechanisms responsible for that carbon uptake, you can think of it as just a disequilibrium between what's in the atmosphere and what's dissolved in the oceans, that the sink is going to continue, all right, as a large sink for a long period of time. It, it, the, the uncertainty there is about how big this sink is, is sort of at second order, right? But for the but for the land sink, it could have either gone away entirely or grown, doubled, tripled, sort of thing. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.